Ellen, lovely to see you. Um, it's lovely to see you. Too. <laughs> well, th thank you. Um, I think we've only met once before, and that was at a dive show, and you did a, yes. a an interview for us. Uh, Birmingham. Yeah. Absolutely. And where are you based right now? At the moment, I'm based in the UK, in lovely West Sussex, an area of natural outstanding beauty, and I absolutely love it. I lived in the Caribbean for 12 years, uh, Grand Cayman, and before, well, I, I am from Belgium. So that's where I was born and raised. Right, I was just looking at, at, um, at what you've just said on your website from Belgium, living in Grand Cayman, and then it says traveler, explorer, adventurer, and then it says, in awe of nature's beauty. I mean, that's, yes. just, that's just such, such a lovely sentence. Can you tell us a bit more about that. It's just, well, it's who I am. I can be, um, like, life throws everybody some stuff. And how you deal with it depends on the person you are. But if you can find happy moments in nature like just watching clouds or the grass growing or little frogs developing from tadpoles to frogs and if you can find your joy in those wonders i think life can be very beautiful whatever you're experiencing and and that's actually how i i'm, I'm grateful to nature for everything that it's giving me and um and, and that's I, I am in awe I can, I, can, I can really be happy just walking out the door and hear the buzzing of the bumblebees and knowing that, okay, it's good. Life is still continuing. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, 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 absolutely. It's, it's so sad that so many people are so divorced from nature and wildlife and, and what's out there. And, you know, not through any fault of their own, it's just they they either live in cities or their environments have been built on, and yeah, that that struggle just to get people reconnected with nature is is quite a yeah. hard one. It is hard, and sometimes you see people passing, like even in a city. And I grew up in in an in an urban environment, but when I went to a park, um, you have all the beauty there, and if you can't see it it actually takes a lot away from your life. So, and I think it's up to parents to, um, to um, like plant little seeds in children to observe. Because if you can't observe, you don't see. Yeah, that's so true. One of my, one of my great joys is with my two grandchildren who are now six and eight, two girls. And wow. You know, they're, they're okay. They're normal kids. <laughs> but just occasionally, you know, we're out in the fields or something uh, or on the coast and then they'll see something or you'll describe something and show them. And just just that, the way their faces light up, right? It's discovery. It's yeah. fantastic. So the kids. Yeah, and you, with kids, you have to really slow your pace and listen to them and then they will listen to you and if you can have this shared experience in nature i think they um they keep it for the rest of their lives yeah absolutely they do they do looking again at, at your um website um and i'll come back to it quite a bit because it's 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 a lovely site uh, freelance a bit of updating. <laughs> <laughs> they all do it's it's hard to keep on yeah. top uh, freelance underwater and wildlife photographer documenting animals in particular regions and the challenges they're facing. Yeah. So tell us a bit more about that as well. Um, I've, I started diving in the Cayman Islands, which is um, nice and warm blue water. But then I was confronted after a year of diving with um, a DCI, an undeserved bent. And actually the diving was not so good for me because I had a heart issue. So I started choosing my subjects um, where I could make a difference. And it brought me to the Arctic. 
And it brought me to subjects like um, beluga whales because I was, and, and orca whales because I was um, against animals in captivity, certainly um, mammals in captivity. Um, and those environments are so extreme. And to get in the water with those animals, it's so hard. But I, it, it gave me a lot of satisfaction because you have to go again and again and again, and you only have a few chances to actually nail a shot. But when you nail it and you can um, tell the story is about those animals in their context, it gives a lot of satisfaction. So then I was thinking, okay, what, what, else, what other animals can I do? And I, uh, I was always intrigued by harp seals and, and the, the, when, when I was young, I saw this picture of Brigitte Bardot with a harp seal pup, like the white fluffy harp seal. And it was a story about the clubbing and how to prevent the clubbing. And there needed to be laws to pre prevent um, the, the codes being sold in Europe and everything. But those laws are in place. And the story about those fluffy, cute animals became a story about climate change because um, the moms they travel from Greenland to give birth to the pups on the ice flows. But if the ice is not good, all the pups drown. So to me, going to those places, documenting uh, those animals and how they live and how they um, actually die, <laughs> most of the years the mortality rate is quite, quite high. It, it, to me, it's, they are the eyes of climate change. And then, of course, you have animals that need ice for breeding and you have animals that need ice for hunting, like polar bears, which I've always also been to twice or three times. Um, those are interesting stories. And if you, can, if you can just take the images and you do nothing with those images, those stories don't, don't get to the people that need to hear them. So what I really love to do is go to... Uh, classes to school kids and tell those stories and actually show funny images of me on the eyes being totally ridiculous and being cold. But those kids then can relate to those stories and they say, oh, we never knew. And because they only see nice images, they don't hear about the animals in the environment. And, and I really love to make a few connections and plant again a few seeds. What are the reactions of the kids that you that you show all this to? How do they react? Well, in the beginning, they're like in awe, so inspiring, and you're exploring, and you go to places where it's hard to go to, and because most of the time, I'm actually staying on the ice, like with an icebreaker, like small uh, former fishing vessel or something and then we get iced in and a bigger marine vessel has to come and rescue us or um, with polar bears we are there on uh, snow sc scooters and we try to sleep um, in huts former um, hunting huts so it's quite adventurous and then I tell the story of how you need to find a place to pee and how you you those things and the kids go like they really love it but then at the end of the story, when I tell how many of the animals die and what they need to know to preserve the earth in our planet and the oceans, some start crying. And then they just want a hug at the end of the talk. And I give the hug and then I give them a little blue marble and I give them a postcard with a polar bear. And then they, they come to me and they tell me we're going to try to save this. So that's, yeah, that's heartwarming because yeah. they do care. Children and the younger they are, the more they still care. And then they go home and they tell their parents. And if, even if one of the kids becomes the next Sylvia Earl, it's good. Because people can be very influential if, if they speak up and if they do their research and if they are a big light in, in one of the um, yeah, marine biology um, spin-offs, they can do great things. Yes, I, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, because you're an individual, it, it doesn't mean to say you can't do anything. It's, it's yeah. people do feel and, unempowered. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that's why I'm so vocal in, in smaller groups or just go to schools and try to um, get in touch with, with individuals too, because I was this, um, I wanted to give. I 
take pictures and I want to give and I wanted to work with NGOs and everything. But it's hard as an individual to work with an NGO because they have these questions. Why do you do this? What do you want from us? Um, why do you want to give time and effort? And I was like, I just want to help. Um, and then I got turned away so many times that I think, but I can, I can make a difference. It's just up to me to open up my mouth as me and, and try to inspire others. And that's what I've been doing actually since I started. So, yeah. Oh. Oh. You, you brought back um, some memories of, of Svalbard. I, I went there, I don't know, uh, 20 odd years ago uh, to make a film about polar bears for Anglia TV. And when I arrived, I mean, this was totally new to me. Snow, ice, glaciers, 24-hour daylight. It was, yeah. I was just absolutely staggered. But even then, as we arrived, the whole bay was full of ice. It was beautiful. And the very next morning when we woke up, it had gone. And it's it was weird. extraordinary. And, you know, the, the scientists who were staying with there um, at the base were saying, we've never seen this before. It's never happened. And, and now it's just, you know, the ice doesn't even appear anymore. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very hard going there because you just, first, it's hard to get, to where the polar bears are because you have to find the ice. So you're on the snow scooters going to white, 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 and you have the whiteouts and you don't know what's going to be behind the corner. And, and then you find the ice and then it's not good. So you have to go to another place, but the, the clock is ticking because I would love to have the luxury of staying there like three months, but those places are also very expensive. So it's, it's a lot of frustration, but as long as you're happy with whatever Thing you can document still it's worth it um, but it's a sad story and then sometimes you see the polar bears and then you watch them hunting and they don't get the seal and then you know oh in two days the ice is gone and you see they're not fat enough to survive the summer it's it's sad don't you think it's very confronting when you're there yes i do uh, it's always frustrated me that throughout my career um, I've been paid to go and make films about wildlife and environments and it's to me it's never the true story so for yeah. instance going to Svalbard the ice had disappeared um, it wasn't to be put in the film because it was a film about polar bears and their behavior yeah. and so this this incredibly important news doesn't get broadcast. It doesn't get shown. No, and, and things only then appear years and years later when it's too late almost. Yeah. And even now, you see when you have um, pictures of, of, of dead turtles or something, those are not the images people want to see because no. they want, especially with the pandemic, they want good news. They want nice images. Um, but... Anyway, if I give a presentation, I do put th the sad images in it, but I end with a good note because you have to give people hope. But, but they, they need to be shown. And I think if more and more people um, will show those images, um, but not bomb people with bad news, then um, it, the news will get out and will get spread. So, yeah, yeah that's it is, It's true. You, you, you can't... Or it doesn't work if you bombard people with, with bad images. They just turn off and, and it's a shame. Yeah. I, I do have a, 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 an amazing memory of being in Svalbard. We were in this, this little bay, covered, and it was covered in ice with a glacier behind it. Yeah. And the seals were, it was, the ice was quite thin. I mean, you could actually put your hand through it if you wanted to. But the seals were either on the shore or just under the water, and they were singing. Oh. And so I couldn't see them, but this singing was coming out of the ice and echoing around the cliffs of the bay. And it was, it was like angels singing. That's beautiful. It was just, it, just incredible. I, I've, I've never heard it again since. It, it, it was just, um, yeah, <laughs> I shall yeah. never forget it. One of those moments in doing wildlife that, that just sits there. Yeah, like for me, one of well, you have many of those moments, but 
some are more precious than others. And to me, being on Hudson Bay, like it was very bad weather and nobody went out because it was just, you, at that time you could still snorkel with beluga whales. Um, but I was there all alone with a female captain and we, we, we felt pretty badass going out in not too good weather. And um, we had the most incredible encounter with two pots of male belugas and they showed dominance behavior. And I was in the water with them and they started bumping me and they started like opening their mouths and, and a bit snapping sounds. And I felt it was like, okay, this is enough of those male <laughs> dominance um, performances. I have to get out because it became a bit dangerous. They're big animals. They're yeah, 300 kilos or something. So I got out and they didn't want to let us leave. So we couldn't start the engine of the boat. And they started also, they, they are very vocal anyways. You can always hear them. But suddenly they started all together being super vocal. And it was the most beautiful symphonic orchestra <laughs> I've ever heard with the mist coming in. So we needed to get out of there. It was so surreal. Um, and I do think it was for us, like two females between all these male belugas. <laughs> I like, I yeah, like absolutely. That. And why not? <laughs> yeah, and I know we can't anthropomorphize, but I do it anyway because it connects me. And well, after all the years, Jane Goodall was um, was allowed or was respected for doing it anyway. So, yeah, I have no issue. I think marine mammals have a lot in common with human beings. I find it actually difficult not to anthropomorphize. Yeah. I mean, how can you not? I mean, when you spend a little time with any species, you start to recognize all the behaviors, the expressions, yeah. the moods the, yeah. that we have. Yeah, even last summer I spent uh, in lockdown in Cayman Islands. It was my last summer there. Once we were allowed back in the water, um, I went diving to, you probably know the spot, um, Devil's Grotto, Eden Rock. And I saw this, uh, it was a lot of squid, like Caribbean reef squid. And I was just so happy to be back in the water and, and to see the changes in, in light and to see the changes in color. And they started um, uh, mating. But there was one specific squid and he had a little wound um, on his skin. And I went back day after day after day, just being happy to be in the water. And I saw that squid, I, I say him, maybe it was a her, Every day, and I, it, every day it was in front of my dome, and every day it was just almost kissing my dome. And then, of course, you know, squid, they don't have a long life. One day I go back and I don't see him anymore. So I know he must have died because he did his job, he did the mating. But you, you get, like, attached, don't you? Y yes, you do. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you start recognizing certain animals and you name them even, and you... Yeah, you see, I go back to my to my little squid tomorrow. <laughs> so I think if you make that connection, it also shows in your uh, film or in your images. Because if for me, if I don't have a connection, I don't shoot. So I have, most of my images are very frontal or very eye to eye, yeah. because I want to get the viewer involved, um, get them actually to see what I see. And, um, yeah, I need that connection to be able to take an image. And they are beautiful images. I'm just looking again at, at um, your gallery on your site. And the blue girl I see up there is, yeah, is, um, yeah lovely. But my, one of my favourites is uh, it's a sort of half-in, half-out shot of a ray, rays on the sand. Yeah. And then you can just see the line of swell and the sky above. I mean, it's 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 beautiful. I love those shots where you can actually see the surface and the bottom as well. I just think yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, over the over the years, certainly since I started, um, when I started, I, I didn't, except for um, uh, very few people, I didn't know any women that were in underwater filmmaking or photography. It's increased hugely over the years which yeah. is fantastic it's brilliant um did you actually have 
any trouble starting your career? Was it difficult or did you just fall straight into it and, and go? It was never something I would never imagine when I became, when I turned 40, I would never think about being in the water and taking images. But um, we moved to the Cayman Islands, relocated. Uh, I homeschooled my kids and suddenly I had a bit of time on my hands. So, so okay, now I'm going to um, start to dive. And um, while diving, I was a tiny bit bored because normally I was juggling so many things. So I said, okay, I'm going to pick up my childhood dream, um, taking images. So I bought this little camera, like a, an EPL in, in a housing. And, um, and I immediately contacted Alex Mustard to do a workshop on island because living in the Cayman Islands, he, he teaches there yearly. And he said, well, with a small camera and, and not so many dives, I'm not sure, but um, keep diving. And if you, um, if you buy a wide angle, like a fisheye lens and a, and a mini dome, you're welcome on the workshop. So I did just that. And on my first workshop, there's all these guys with these big cameras. And I'm there and there's an image of us all in the pool, like for the group shot. And I'm so happy with my little camera and all the guys are very um, yeah, like very much of it. Um, I didn't have a lot of trouble starting, but I definitely felt that they were thinking, what is this lady doing here? Like she's older. She doesn't, she, she only has 30 dives or something. What is she doing here? But then within a few months, I started winning some competitions and well, they never questioned me again. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I also I didn't want to prove me. I, I don't think you have to prove yourself. I, I just let the images speak and it turned out pretty okay because now I have the respect of my peers and, and, and it gives me, it makes me happy that I didn't have to go like, you know, I can do it. I'm a woman. I think it, as long as your skills shine through. And I'm not very technical. I'm just a very emotional shooter, but it is accepted, so it's good. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. And I mean, talk about being uh, recognizing things. Just one of your uh, credits is Woman Divers Hall of Fame, 2019. Yeah. Did, what, tell us about that. Uh, it's it's this um, organization um, in the states. And every year there, um, I think it started in 2000, where you had all these big names like Michelle Hall, um, Anne Dubile, um, Valerie Taylor. They're all, they were all inducted in the Women Divers Hall of Fame. Um, but as a European, to be recognized by these people that actually, most of the people are from... California, where the diving was already big before the whole of Europe started diving. So to be recognized by these legends was very special for me, uh, certainly because I was not a diver for a long time, but I, I'm just a doer. I'm a mover and a shaker. So behind the scenes, I've been um, trying to get sharks protected in like remote areas. Um, I've been connecting people to get things done. I'm um, the curator of the United Nations World Oceans Day competition um, and even connecting some people there. So, yeah, it was a big honor and I'm very happy with it. Um, it's sad we can't see each other uh, like for the past two years, but I'm sure um, more and more people from Europe and from Asia are going to be recognized for what they've done in a short time or in a long time. So, and, and the good thing is about this Women Divers Hall of Fame, what they do is they do fundraising and then they actually give grants to young women and men um, to get more um, education in diving or in specific fields of diving. Um, and that might be like the start of something bigger. So, but it's, it's more like um, fundraising, mentorship uh, for the next generation. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Looking again at, at the list of things that, that you've achieved and stuff, it, it just caught my eye 
um, specialist or uh, speciality um, Asperger's uh, in relation to autism. How does that fit into your life? So 23 years ago, I became a mother. And um, 21 years ago, I became again a mother. And my kids um, were wonderful. But um, I used to babysit a lot. And I um, experienced that they were not reacting like um, the normal kids. And um, I suspected there was something, but I didn't know what. Of course, when they went to school, it became more obvious because they don't like social contact and, and those things. So long story short, they were diagnosed with uh, high-functioning autism. And even longer story short, also my ex-husband was diagnosed with high-functioning autism, ADHD, and Gilles de la Tourette. Um, when I started diving, and I connected to those animals in a, in a specific way, and I have this very shots that people recognize like okay that's a shot of Ellen I think being an observer towards um, raising children with high functioning autism you have to be an observer because you have to be prepared for everything you have to know maybe you do something now or you say something now and in two weeks um, your kid will come up with it or express how it made them feel or um, that it was wrong to say something or that the information was wrong. So I had to be tiptoeing like the whole time and observing everything they did and I did. And when I started diving, I, I was a natural observer then. And I think it contributed to the connection with the animal. And also um, communication with people with autism has to be very... Um, without without um without extras very direct and very clear and i think when you're in the water despite us not being able to communicate with animals our body is still communicating so our signals have to be clear and and precise so that we don't give an animal the wrong impression and i think all that um so my knowledge that i have with autism contributes to me being a better photographer or better in connecting with uh, animals. So it's a strange combination, but I think it had to be that way. And I love my, my children and they're amazing and they're functioning very well, but I do respect them in being different because people should be allowed to be different. So I don't want them to behave like 99% of the people in, on earth. I want them to behave like themselves and be happy. Uh, yes, and being different, I think, is a great bonus sometimes. Yeah. It, uh, it's the people that are different that, that often make the huge um, changes in the world. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's, so they're not to be snuffed out, my goodness. No, it's all about being able to think outside of the box. Mm. And if you can do that, you're a good problem solver. You're, you're just very resilient also sometimes. I think with the whole pandemic, I experienced that my kids are more resilient to not seeing people because they like it. They like the peace and quiet. Um, while other, for other children, it has been an absolute disaster. So it's, it's all about perspective and context. And, and yeah. I, I can certainly um, associate with the peace and quiet, but <laughs> yeah. it's my favorite state of being, I think. So, do, you, do, do your boys dive? Are they able to go in the water? Or They're do... little girls, uh, and they have been diving in um, Cayman Islands. They have been diving with um, sharks, like tiger shark, oceanic white tips. They have been diving with the silver sides, but they don't like the, um, the wetsuits because like, they're a bit sensor, sensory oversensitive. Um, but if there's something very special going on in the water, they will dive again, I know. Oh, that's good. That's good. So they, they certainly wouldn't dive here in the UK. It has to be very worthwhile. Yes. Probably, I'm going to introduce them to a dry suit because it's less ah, on the skin. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Maybe just for some snorkeling in the beginning, like with the seals in Northumberland. Who knows? Yeah. It, it's... it's 
interesting how if people have uh, whatever reason don't really want to get in the water if you have something like seals next to the boat yeah. and, you, and you have the option to, to be able to get in the water with them like all thoughts everything else is gone yeah, yeah, yeah. and Absolutely. it's ah uh, yeah. yeah, well, I hope it happens. My gosh, I hope it happens. Yeah. Where's, the, where's the nearest sea to you? Um, that's accessible? Brighton, but I don't know. I haven't been there for diving um, because I just relocated in um, December and then life caught up a bit. So we had a lot to do and um, some issues with health. So, yeah, I'm looking forward getting out there and um i've been diving chisel beach two years ago so that's on my list and then i have um a former captain i worked with in ascension island is now based in um farmwood and he wants to take me out to see the basking sharks and to see some sharks and to see some tuna because he's involved with the tuna tagging for exeter university the tuna that comes in through the irish sea so i want to do some magic there um but that's snorkeling so that's not diving and of course i want to go back to the seals and actually before the pandemic i was thinking if i relocate to england i'm just gonna dive the whole coast of england and scotland because i think it's a beautiful you have beautiful waters and they're so rich um, but then, of course, the lockdown started and, and people could not travel anymore. And now a lot of people are rediscovering how beautiful UK is. And that's a good thing. Oh, uh, absolutely. And uh, interestingly enough, just a few days ago, um, I did a review and interviewed Paul Naylor, who... Yeah. Do you know him? Book. I, I saw the book and I ordered it. Yes. It's, yeah. it's Great British Marine Animals. It yeah. is... Um, if anybody ever thought that UK waters were dull, I mean, no. please look at this book. It, it is as rich as it, I mean, it, it hasn't got the abundant diversity of tropical waters, but it is amazing. We're, the waters here are fantastic. Yeah, and I, I do think the abundance, see, what, what I've experienced in, in, in my snorkeling is that once you go a bit further, so pelagic, you have the bigger animals and I do believe you have the same in UK, but it takes like, it takes a day. You have to get out there. You have to look at the water. You have to look at the birds. You have to look at the movements, the currents and everything. I'm, I'm, I can't wait just to hop in the water here in the pelagic and wait like a whole day. That's what I've done in, in Ascension, just on a, on a rope behind the boat and just wait, wait, wait and, and, and watch watch the elements and then suddenly there were like spinner dolphins around or a turtle trying to climb my back or tuna or mahi mahi it's that abundance of life in the big schools they tend not to be where you dive close to shore so i think there is more you just need like people that want to take the time to go there and, and just wait 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 and have yeah. the time also yeah but I, I, I want to travel less and, and dive more locally or be in the water more locally. It was a plan since before I relocated and before the pandemic. Um, yeah. Appreciate what you have around you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And there is so much if you take the yeah. time. And it's yeah. a terrible thing to do. You know, have to sit in a boat all day and just look at nature. <laughs> How, how terrible, yeah. Yeah, it is awful. <laughs> uh, it's been uh, lovely talking to you. Uh, thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, just as a matter of interest, what's, what's, what's next on the horizon for you? I assume it is now what you've just told us, diving and exploring the UK. Yeah, that's big in, in the book, but I do have one expedition planned. Um, it was postponed. It's a um, uh, cave dive expedition in Tulum, well, actually in the Yucatan, uh, in the jungle. We're going to explore some unexplored caves with uh, Robbie Schmidtner, the Sunan Ha expedition. Um, it's um, not all female, but most of them are women. So I'm looking forward to that. That will be in um, 
I think November. And it's actually to highlight the importance of the underground aquifers um, as a source of water and how we need to protect it because uh, they, those aquifers are getting really polluted. So. Yes, they are. I, I spent a um, long time uh, in the Yucatan making film about that very thing for BBC. And before then, I'd, I'd, one of the things I was never ever going to do was cave diving. I just didn't see any point, you know, it's like this. And, yeah. and I thought, okay, I'm really going to do it. And I try, and it was just stunning. I mean, it's amazing. And the exploration and going, going through the forests and finding a little sinkhole, taking a GPS, and then trying to find the tunnels to go with, with, ah, oh, it's, it's, and the scenery is stunning. Beautiful. It's stunning. I, people tell me, and, and I would never have thought of it that I would do something like that because I'm quite claustrophobic. But once you have the tools and a good training and you know what to do and you, it's one of the, it's very safe then. But when people ask me, why do you do it? Because it's the most beautiful place I've ever been in, in those caves. And you can't explain it, but just having a light and on, on, on everything that's going on. It's, yeah, it's, I feel very fortunate to be able to do that. Yeah. One of the, one of the stunning things about it, one of the stunning things about it, because there is a lot, is going through very narrow passages. I mean, sometimes you have to crawl through and stuff. Yeah. And things. But then it can open up into a cathedral-sized cave yeah. that's full of stalagmites and stalactites. And if you've got enough light to light it, it's 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 all inspiring. Yeah, but wow. those things are very hard to capture in an image um, because it's just sometimes too big, and 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 then I just. I just enjoy it. Like, I, um, yeah, it's one. Yeah, it is the most beautiful thing I ever ever saw. It was interesting. I mean, this was quite some years ago when we did this. It was called um, "Secrets of the Mayan Underworld," <laughs> and um, even then, I mean, uh, Cancun, Cancun, <laughs> yes, <laughs> was <laughs> rapidly becoming uh, a very big coastal city. And just being underwater in the caves and seeing, you know, um, pylons being driven down into the aquifer and all that drinking water and all that water that feeds the forests and on and on, even then was at great risk. I don't know what the situation is, is now. I can only imagine it's worse. It is. Um, it's worse. So you have all the divers and the tourists and, and that were actually putting a some pressure on the caves and the caverns. But since the lockdown, they have discovered that a lot of the caves have these bacteria in them. Like really, and if you go diving there, you get skin problems and stuff. So it's really like in a short period of time, it's become a real issue. Even so big that they're a bit worried when tourism comes back in, in bigger numbers that um, people are gonna get ill of dying in certain places, so certain cenotes will be closed, I think. And it has to do not with the diving, but it has to do, of course, with the hotels and the rundown and the golf courses, and you know, um, and, the, and the big pollution. Yeah. Sure. Well, best of luck with that project, yeah, um, really. And um, once again, lovely to catch up. And lovely to talk to you and, and getting to know you a bit better. better. Yeah. Oh, cool, thank you. Well. Um, for now, I'll say goodbye. Okay. Bye-bye, Jeff. Have a lovely day. Thank and you. You too, Alan. <laughs>